What's good, everybody? I'm Steve Discourse. Hey, it's your girl, Jay Kelly. You're back with What's the Deal? We're going to give you a rundown of the most important, the most controversial, the most exciting, most troubling news stories of the past week. Um, maybe we should add in some like joy and stuff in here, too. I would like that. I would appreciate some joy. Given that dis- descriptor just now, I was like, man, that's all really hard work. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes being in this world is hard work. So um, that's what we're going to do. Before we do any of that really heavy lifting, though, what's going on? You got any any little tidbits, morsels, something funny from your yeah, life? I, I have some funny things happening in my life. And you know what? I'm trying to decide if they're funny or if they're terribly sad, but I decided to just laugh at my own pain. So um, this past week, well, let me just say in general, life I've been really balancing, like being a full-time educator and a full-time student, and it's really, really hard, and I've been struggling like crazy. So I turn in a paper, and I got an F. It is the first F <laughs> that I have ever gotten in graduate school. Wow. I was heartbroken. I emailed my professor after I read the feedback and I was like, this is not okay. I worked really hard on this paper. The expectations were not made clear, which is all true. She did not make the expectations clear. See? And I went to her office hours before I turned the paper in and she was like, oh yeah, this is a good idea. This is blah, 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 blah. And then the feedback was like, this topic doesn't even relate to this class. And I was like, lady, we met about this. Why would you do this? Wow. You set me up. And then she was like, you know what? I'm going to give you an extension. I'm going to let you like make edits. I'm going to give you specific feedback, change the paper, turn it in on Friday. And I was like, boom. So I'm working all week. I'm putting the paper off because I got so much other work to do. So Friday comes around. I'm like, let me sit down and write this paper because I'm about to turn this F into an A, baby. This going to be the easiest fix ever. I sit down. I'm so tired. I'm like, I'm going to take a little 15-minute nap. I'm going to bust it out. This is only going to take me an hour. I still had three hours to turn the paper in. So I took a 15-minute nap. I woke up. I was still very sleepy. I was like, just 15 more minutes. I'm going to be good. Even no matter what, I'm going to wake back up. I lay back down. I never reset my 15-minute timer. Oh, hell. <laughs> I woke up two and a half hours later. <laughs> I popped up out of my sleep. I looked at the clock. My paper was due in 15 minutes. And I hadn't even <laughs> fixed anything. <laughs> After I fussed my professor out, wrote her a long email, went to her office hours, I didn't even turn the paper in. She's, She's over here laugh like, at me. yeah, this is why we can't have nice things, see? And then I, I gave him the extensions. Still email it to her. Well, said, you got to. What are you gonna do? Accept. I'm sorry. And I said, listen, I'm not gonna give you a long story. I fell asleep. Okay. I was yeah. really tired, and I was working on it. I thought I submitted it. I, I fell asleep. I'm, That's I'm real life. To do. So I, I feel really bad, but I'm gonna laugh because hopefully I can make. Now I have to get an A on like everything else in the class for the whole rest of the semester. So there we go. You can do that. That's easy. You got this. Boom. Thank you for the encouragement. <sighs> That would, have been, that would have been great to post on Instagram, that whole story right there. But I can't because my battery situation on my phone is super oh. in question today. <laughs> Why? Because I don't have a charger with me. And this is really tragic. This is why it's tragic, right? I, I decided, like, I have two charges in my life. I was like, this is not enough. I've been struggling with, like, a car slash work charger and one home charger for too long. It doesn't work. Mm-hmm. So I bought four extra chargers this week. You know where they're all at? They're not here. Steve. (laughs) What is going on? Because it's out of my routine, right? So I haven't worked them into a routine yet. And so they should have, by default, I have things where they go or in ways where I won't overlook them. And Mm -hmm. I just, they're still sitting like in one spot. And so I'm in my morning routine, getting ready to come out here. And I just didn't think about it. Normally there's just a charger in the car and I take it into work. But so now... I've been struggling with that actually all week because this happened yesterday too. You know, there was somebody at work I could borrow a charger from yesterday. So I was like, they got me by, but yeah, you hold on to my phone so I don't use it needlessly. Um, But all right. So speaking of phones, we got a quick uh, list of quick things we're going to run through. And on the top of that list is why are iPhones so expensive? Because they're worth the money. Doubt it. Team iPhone. I doubt it. They are. 14... Ooh, What's you it? that iPhone sound? Man, turn that ringer <laughs> off while we're recording. Damn it. <laughs> iPhone chargers. I mean, mm-hmm. whatever sounds. Yeah, f- f- $1,450 is the is the newest iPhone. I will most expensive. never. Bruh. 
I don't know. How, let me not say that. I don't know how much I'm currently paying for my phone, but it is a bill. It's too much. Honestly, though, the way they turn these phones over and make them obsolete, even Androids is too expensive for me. That's like true. a brand new Android is seven hundred dollars. True. Yeah. Even every two years, think about seven hundred dollars. What do you spend seven hundred dollars a year on? For me, it's probably chicken nuggets. Two years. Okay. See. <laughs> yeah. So you talking about sustenance? That's true. Versus a phone iPhone price I don't know, goes I'm up saying. every year. I don't know if it's, it's worth wild. fourteen fifty. I remember when they were nine something, and I was like, "Dang!" Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. and that's the, the most. They said the average for the the average cost for like the newest run of models is like uh, eleven hundred and fifty. I think so. The top one is fourteen that's fifty, crazy. and the bottom one is like nine fifty or something. Like I that. lost my that's, MacBook charger the other day, and I went to the Apple store to get a new one, and I did not know that the iPhone X came out the same day, and it was chaos. Oh, yeah, that. you messed up. I was like, I made a fatal mistake today. I should not be here. I'm going right. to die here today. <laughs> I need to get out of here. So it was horrible. She thinks she's getting a phone before us. Boom. And then yeah, the next thing you know, somebody changing. throws a chair, <laughs> and it's a, it's a riot. I didn't like it. Yeah. But um all right, so anyway, I just can't believe that and I mean I think like I said, phones are crazy too expensive anyway. So we're gonna have to find a way to band together and get these people to, to just calm this. Let's this come up with the evil plan. Okay, so boom. Next story real quick. If you're on Facebook, you might have been one of fifty million users that was breached mm -hmm. for your security login. Again. Um they they reset ninety million just to be safe. Wait, I was one. So oh my God. so you were either breached or you were one of the just in cases. I didn't know what was happening. They I know, just got an email. Yeah. Whoa. They know what happened, and it was with a particular feature of, I think, like you can be Log sign in with, as different yes. accounts, right? So they know what happened, so they're working on it. But um, I think the reason I bring this up, because I think the idea of, of like information and data security is kind of like a myth. Mm -hmm. And so this is just going to be routine, these kind of things. Like like every couple months, we're going to hear about some kind of major thing. We have been, whether it's, um, you know, I think Wells Fargo recently. Uh, I can't really think. I, I maybe should have wrote these down. Mm -hmm. But there's always going to be these whole pro high profile things. It's just Equifax was one major one recently. Um, this is just kind of going to be a regular way of life, to be honest with you. you so know people what? are shocked, but there's no way to stop this. Like, when all your information was on a piece of paper in your house, like they can only rob one house right, at a time, right? right? So there's no real risk of security threat on a major way. But now all our information is literally accessible from one laptop or one cell phone. Like this is just a regular way of life. So I'm just letting people know right now. I can literally Google your name and pull up so much information about you. Yeah, and this has inconvenienced me greatly. I currently do not know my new Facebook login password. I've had the same one for years, and now I can't be nosy on the in on the internet anymore. So thanks, internet hackers well, and Mark Zuckerberg. We're still waiting for them to hack and reset all the student loan data. Come on, man. If you're doing something, no, let's like wait, do something. Wait one year. I don't have to pay my loans back for another year. In one year, take them down. We didn't say that. And then um, the whole world laughed at Trump the other day. <laughs> Talk about it. Literally the whole world. <laughs> I didn't. I'm getting my last The whole day. world, yeah. Well, we, you know, by way of our representatives. True. He was speaking with the UN. And this man got up and said, I have accomplished, he said he's accomplished more uh, probably than any other president in the entire history of the country. And legit, it was like two or three seconds passed after he said that. And there's like <laughs> laughter in the whole like assembly just started like busting up. They were like, bro, is he serious? <laughs> Why did he even allow the two to three seconds? Because I feel like he the pause like, made it even more he, too bad. But yeah, the whole world, like, and I think that's fair to say the whole world because it they is. technically represent us. It each each head of the UN for your country oh, laughed man. on your behalf. The entire world laughed at this man. My heart and hurts. I don't have a greater message with that, but I just thought it was worth sharing because um, that was enjoyable. I need to see the clip again. It yeah. just needs to be and a then he goes, gift. And I don't know how he really felt about it, but it, he, he literally says, okay, not the reaction I was expecting, but okay. <laughs> That's what he said. And I don't know if he was mad or if he didn't understand. Oh, little tink tink. If he didn't take it the way we took it, but I took it as like, cool. I mean, everybody knows, but like it's nice to, everybody knows. Maybe he'll take a little humble, he'll humble himself a little bit. Come on, man. Don't be making those types of statements. You know we don't like you. Right. You know you're not doing a good job. So, yeah, anyway, so on to, to, to the, some of the more serious business. You got a story in, from Virginia? 
Yes, and it's actually quite sad. So the Virginia Department of Corrections will now be banning women from entering to visit inmates if they're wearing tampons or menstrual cups. And their reason is because they want to prevent people from smuggling in illegal contraband. So what happens is you go into the prison. You want to see your dad or your husband or whoever, or maybe it's your mom. Who knows which prison you're going into? You want to visit your loved one. And someone comes out and they subject you to a full body scan. And you are not allowed to have any items inside of any of your body cavities, including your vagina, even if you are menstruating. So they say, excuse me, ma'am, you can either take that out and take this pad or you can leave. And literally those are the only two options. You cannot argue. You just you are not coming in here wearing your menstrual items if it's not a pad. So I just feel like it is exclusionary, but it's obviously also extremely sexist. You cannot stop someone who's menstruating from coming into a prison well, like every woman, some women legitimately hate pads. Like it's gross for some people. I don't understand how you can, as an institution of the law, I get it, the contraband piece, but how many people are actually smuggling drugs in through their vagina? Well, and that was my question. Like, what is the basis? I get like maybe the basis and the reasoning, but is there, are they like finding this regularly? Like, hold on, you got something? See, now we got to check everybody. Because it I was mean. enough? Like, I mean, and this reminds me when they were banning the sale of books from mm-hmm. certain sellers because mm-hmm. they thought they were getting drugs smuggled in through the books. Uh-huh. Remember we, we talked, talked about, about that a couple months ago. And it's like in the same situation, it's like, well, where is like the data to back up that, to that this it. is a real problem? And, and did they say that? Did they say like I'm we sure get- that there's data out there. I don't have that data currently today. But what I'm curious to know is, is it going to be staggering enough for them to excuse the fact that they are taking such an extreme measure? Because yeah. I do think, first of all, simply people doing these types of body scans are already extremely intrusive. And I've never met anybody who's comfortable with taking those types of body scans. So now that I know as a woman I'm coming in and I feel like, oh, my gosh, they're going to do this body scan. And one of the things that I know that they specifically look for is if I'm wearing a tampon or a menstrual cup. How do you think that's going to make me feel? Yeah, I mean, that's... The fact that you can even see that is like, what? I didn't even know. I know that it, like, tells you, oh, something fishy is going on in this area of the body. But the fact that they're like, oh, is that is that a tampon, ma'am? Here, have this pad. Like, is this going to be some grungy old prison guard giving me some prison pad? Yeah. What, the, what? Yeah, that's really Ick. an uncomfortable situation. Like, I, and What I'm about just, the women that work for the prison? It didn't really mention them in the article that I read. I guess it they're okay because they're past security or right. whatever. So it's and like, I'm well, sure we trust them. Right, and I'm See? sure they already have to go through their own level of security searches yeah. to come into work each day. Yeah, but that would be interesting. Are they getting checked there too? Because they're not above it, you know what I mean? Yeah, Anybody might be are. on some little shady side business, so you never know. So. I wonder about that, too. So my, uh, my thing, crazy. I'm like, there are so many ways that you can check to see, like, is this person smuggling drugs or is she actually on her menstrual cycle? But I can't think of a way where you could check that that isn't equally or even more intrusive than the body scan. That damn, so they're kind of, so they're damned if they do, damned if they don't, right. sort of. They're going to have to figure it out because what they're doing now, and just, I think they're currently on pause with making the final decision because of how much pushback they've received. Right. So I'm going to keep my eyes and ears open for more updates on this story, and hopefully I can come with some better news. But for this week, it's just this sick, sad Yeah, shit. well, we put, as a society, as a culture, we put a lot of pressure, weight on women. You know, and we're going to talk about that a lot more later mm-hmm. um, as regards to Kavanaugh. Because, yeah, everybody tuned in and was wondering, wait, they're going to talk about this, right? We'll talk about Brett Kavanaugh and Dr. Ford and um, some related stories about that uh, towards the last part of the show. So we'll come back to that. Um, we've got a lot to say about that. Yes. So um, last week in D.C., there were five murders in uh, 48 hours. That's and yeah, it's really troubling. It's they're one at that time they were one away from last year's total. Mm-hmm. So a full three months ahead, they've they've pretty much matched the total. So that's troubling. And um uh, th- there's not a whole lot of details that have been shared about any given story, and I, I don't necessarily think that's the point um to discuss any of them in detail, but 
it does raise the question of like, what do you, I mean, what, what can we do? Not just in DC, but any city, any town where there's a lot of tension and conflict like this. Mm -hmm. And cause I don't know. And for me, most of my adult life has been relocating a lot. Like I grew up in Jersey, lived in Seattle, Miami, and now DC. So I don't have strong roots and ties in a given community. And so this is a hard thing for me to fully know how I can grapple and, and engage with. But, you know, it is a problem that's happening a lot in, in Chicago as well, most notably, you know, recorded. But, I mean, people are getting killed in, in a lot of places, probably unnecessarily, you know. But I, I, what is your take? You've been in D.C. for a while. You're from this region in general. Um, that's because that's all yeah. I've got to really add to this. So I want to hear what you what you think. Yeah, I, have, I grew up in Virginia, but I've been living in D.C. for eight years now. And I've been, I've lived in Northwest D.C., I've lived in Northeast D.C., I've lived in Southeast D.C. I currently live in Southeast. And something that is particularly interesting about this is I recently just realized where I live. And I don't want to come off as if, as if I'm bashing Southeast or as if I'm perpetuating a stereotype about the area. But I'm recently like, it's not safe. Where I live is not safe. What happens in my neighborhood or what happens in my community is not something that I want to be exposed to. It's not something that, as a teacher, I'm happy that my students are exposed to. And I find myself getting more and more emotional in these past few weeks because um, I don't know if I mentioned this on the show a couple weeks ago, but I'm on my way to work really early, 7 in the morning, and people are, like, fighting and stabbing one another. You know what I mean? Schools in the area go on lockdown because people are shooting right outside. There have even been instances where the parents are fighting one another at the school, like when they're dropping off their kids or picking their kids up. And it's just very interesting because I never used to work in the neighborhood that I live in. I just started working in southeast D.C. And um, it's very different than the school that I previously worked at in northeast D.C. as far as violence in the surrounding area. Like sometimes I walk to the store close to my school and there are so many people out there arguing, yelling. And I feel bad because some people have mental problems, but I see people walking around with like no clothes on, just yelling at like thin air. And I'm like, this is the neighborhood that I've desensitized myself to what's actually going on around here. Like I walk past this stuff every day, but before I had to work here or experience children or really be a member of the community and not just someone who sleeps here and then goes off and lives my life. It's like, wow, we actually really do have a lot more work to do. And like, I have to be, I have to push myself hard to stay here because life can be overwhelming. And sometimes I want to not put in my due diligence to helping other people. But now I'm like, it, it's not the time to quit. This is the time to really plow forward and like make the situation better for our people. So how work you know the work that's the question pay, first of all pay attention to what's going on and be real with yourself and don't try to make excuses for what you see or don't try to normalize the behaviors that you see if you see people i'm be i'm just being real again i don't want to filter myself if you see people that are smoking crack at 6 a.m or if you see people that are stabbing each other at 7 a.m or that are shooting right outside of an elementary school you got to be like don't just say oh man that's that southeast shit say this is crazy. We have to do better. We need to put more support systems in place to help these people that are experiencing these traumas, these people that are having these anger issues, people that have these drug addictions. What information can be put out there? And there's so many people that are doing this type of work already. But I'm talking about for me personally. What could I continue to do to make this situation better other than walk past it and not make eye contact with people because I don't want them to talk to me? Like it has to be more. Yeah, it's uh man, it's complicated. And there are and and especially in DC, um I've been following a woman on Instagram. I, I haven't met her in person yet, but a lot of people I know know her. She's born and raised in DC, uh Miss Hardy, and I know she's organizing a lot of guns down events to mm -hmm. just get people out in the community um and I think in, in a way to conspicuously confront and prevent the violence by just filling it filling the space with people mm -hmm. who, who aren't involved in the violence, right? And sort of taking over that space in a way um, and making it vocal and active that that's why they're doing that. And hopefully I got that right. This is from what I understand from conversations I've had with people from following her words and ideas and messages on social media. And right. um, 
one day we'll cross paths. So I'll actually meet her. Maybe we should just try and get her on the show sometime uh, to talk about stuff like this. Cause it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I don't know what the answer is, but um, I don't know. It seemed important to bring up because this is something that's going on in, in towns and cities and counties or, you know, around the country to, to different extents. And um, yeah, maybe this is something we can kind of touch back on regularly and have different takes and perspectives and, and keep that conversation going because it's just, I mean, it's crazy. And I mean, the, the, some of these people were in their mid twenties, uh, some of these victims were 41, 37, 45 years old as well. And so this is not just young people. Uh, it's not just older people either. It's it's kind of a range of victims here this weekend, uh, at least. I don't know about the, the demographics for people who die yeah, all year definitely. necessarily. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, something a conversation to keep having going forward. Um. So moving on to another story that's based in D.C. but is is growing in commonality in mm-hmm. other parts of the country is speeding cameras. Lordy. So <laughs> it's, it's reported recently, uh, earlier this week, that in 2017, the District of Columbia, which is a city, for those of you listening who are not from the D.C. area, it's an actual city. It's not just a, and thank you for reminding me to conserve my phone battery. <laughs> Uh, Because I was literally wasting, like, so they just, D.C. is a city, and I find that people I talk to who've never lived here have a hard time understanding that it's an actual regular city that also happens to have politicians. A lot of people, I don't know if they imagine it like a college campus that's just all politicians. (laughs) It's... It's not. You know what they imagine? It's just the National Mall and that's it. Kind when of, you say yeah. D.C., it's like, oh, yeah, monuments and stuff. People kind of walking around taking pictures and it's not a real state, right? Right. And it's, it. it's it's Yeah, it's a real place. And so they collected, they issued a million speeding camera tickets last year mm-hmm. in 2017. Mm-hmm. They collected $104 million approximately, that was what was reported, off of these tickets. And that's a lot of money. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But what caught me is that in the same story, like members of the mayor's administration were saying that they're excited because the new generation of speed cameras are going to be smaller, harder to spot for drivers, and they can like install them where drivers are not necessarily going to see them. And this is what gets me because in D.C., like in many other cities, they have um, what what they're calling a Vision Zero initiative, which Mm -hmm. is a program to reduce major injuries or fatalities from traffic incidents. And that's good, but I don't understand how hiding speeding yeah. cameras is going to stop anybody it's from not. speeding. It's just, aha, aha, we got you, moment. Yeah, I was just about to say, that sounds like you're actually just going to now make more money off speeding tickets right. because people didn't see it. But everyone's just going to continue to zip right by. It's, at least when you have those big, right now the speeding cameras in D.C. are so big, you can literally see right. them and, and there's so many conversations right now about how to handle car traffic, how to support if we should support public transportation, what do you do about these damn scooters that people are zipping around on? And I don't necessarily have a problem. I just find people riding them are super annoying because mm-hmm. they really pop out of nowhere. Like I'll be driving and whoa, you know, I'm going to make a turn and people zip, 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 boom. Jay, like it's not Jay walking, but like the scooter usage is kind of wild. But like, so what do we do about bikes and scooters and all that? And, and marry those in with traffic mm-hmm. and cars and how do we encourage public transportation and Uber is still exploding with cars and everything. So this is, I'm all for limiting, you know, traffic fatalities and everything like that. It's great, but I don't like these sneaky ass lies yeah. where they say, Oh, you know, speed. We're, Cause they're also going to raise the cost of speeding tickets. Whoa. And, and it's like, this is not helping it you might. get to zero tickets. Know. Look, it's not, I, don't know. I, I mean, it will in a camera, way, Yeah, the but big- how many people are coming through this region as visitors or as seasonal? They're only here for an election season or for um, a term limit for the person that they work for in the government or whatever it is. It's like if you really want people to slow down, you you put a big sign that says speeding camera right here. That's what I was about to say. And I you feel put like that on blast. Cameras- are more likely to make a person slow down because they see the camera and, and they be like, oh, I'm speeding, and they become right. more cognizant. Exactly. But also they only slow down when they're going past the camera because they pick it right back up. Listen, I, I never speed ever. 
Of course you don't. Ever. But I slow Especially, down when I see those cameras. Right. Like, everyone does. But, like, as a person who's I never a new driver in D.C., right, it is very scary the way people drive here. And I can understand how, like, hitting somebody with a million-dollar fine, they'll be like, let me chill. I don't even know where these cameras at anymore. Like... If I get caught up, I'm going to have to pay my whole rent check on this speeding ticket. Let me just chill. Because they zip through. People are crazy. They don't even stop for me when I'm in the crosswalk sometimes. And I'm just like, you just going to kill a person today? You don't care? What the heck? Yeah, it's a problem. And and like a lot of things that the government wants to do, I think they're just going about it in a wrong way. And and not fully honest either. Because, yeah, the fact that they want to hide these things, I think is just total bullshit. Um, I also don't think... It should be constitutional. I can get a uh, law enforced against me by a camera. You know, this is not Terminator, right? Sure. We can't have robots enforcing laws, right? It's not RoboCop. But that's a whole other aside. I'm going to get a constitutional lawyer on the show, and we can debate whether this is constitutional or not. I say it's not. I feel like we can just Google it, and then we don't have to talk to Google another person. Google doesn't know, man. Google's going to give you lies. <laughs> lies. So, all right, moving along. I got to hit you with the grocery list. Uh, I hate to sound so casual like that. The grocery list of police abuse that we're going to keep chronicling in in a brief situation. So, um, one, we got a deputy in Florida, and deputies are are police officers but work for, like, counties. Mm -hmm. And counties usually have sheriffs. Cities and and towns Mm -hmm. have police officers and police stations and and police chiefs. A deputy is, like, counties generally have a police force Mm -hmm. that covers the whole county, unless a town in the county has, like, its own police yeah, force. Yeah, so, wow. so a deputy in Florida um, was arrested for um, because uh, body cam footage showed him planting meth on a suspect. Oh, how dumb. And so immediately upon this evidence, they released eight individuals. Five other um, individuals were scheduled to be released related with his investigations. 30 cases were dropped, and another 263 were under review. Because it is crooked cop. Mm-hmm. So, thanks for nothing, sir. Uh, number two, what do we got? Um, a, a cop in Texas hit a schoolgirl while he was driving through um, a school zone. With his car? Yeah. And there, mm-hmm. there weren't a lot of details at the time that I was reading this, but the key detail is, emphatically, the police uh, spokesman came out and blamed the girl. What? Oh my gosh! More blaming women for the mistakes of men. She was, um, <laughs> I'm gonna get into I didn't, this later. I didn't write this down, but I think she was uh, eight or nine years old. This that is a is young sad. child. That's really pathetic. And and they came out as upstanding members of society here to protect little girls like this, and said, "Well, wasn't our fault for damn sure." This little girl's fault. I'm just really confused about what could an eight-year-old have done to contribute to herself being hit. As an adult, it's your job. It doesn't even matter if it's not your child. You see a kid, you are cautious. They make mistakes. They don't even have developed peripheral vision, so I'm confused. Right, so maybe she wasn't looking and jumped out or tried to cross the street. She shouldn't, but you're a cop. Of all people, you're driving through a school zone. You got to be on alert. You got to be, you're supposed to be the model for the rest of us. It is a proven fact that children cannot see right. when cars are coming. That is why you teach them to look both ways. They can't see it out of their peripheral vision. They just can't. You need to be looking for kids when you're driving. You're by a school, for Christ's sakes. What? I'm really upset. An eight-year-old? Goodbye. Lock him up. Throw away the key. <laughs> Don't let him out. That's sad. What else? Yeah, um, I'm just trying to pull up a little bit more of information on a man in Reno who was killed while sitting in his truck. Mm -hmm. Police police were responding to like a domestic disturbance dispute. And um, again, we want to keep moving through these two. It's pretty quick. So the fact of the matter is this man, um, not related directly to the response, but he was in a cul-de-sac in his car and the light in the car was on and he ended up shot and killed. So, again, again, whether he was guilty of some crime or not, whether he did something confusing or suspicious or not, here's another man dead in the street with no due process, no arrest, you know, no criminal hearings, right? No, no due process, any of that. So, 
Um, I mean, again, I've still got others on this list, and, and we can keep going, but it bears repeating that this happens time and again, this abuse, this lack of proper judgment, and what also stands is is a total reluctance to actually mm-hmm. hold anyone accountable. Well, I mean, because f- for the rest of us, you mess up at work, you might be fired, and we we don't have that. That's a double standard that doesn't exist for, for law enforcement. I think it should. Right. So we just got to keep highlighting these things without going into real detail and belaboring it. But the point is this is regular and I could have 10 a week on this show if we wanted to spend that much time. So that's business as usual. Right. <laughs> I don't even so like it. now getting to the marquee matchup, so to speak, the, <laughs> the main event. I don't like this either. That everybody has been talking about all week is the hearing uh, or the whole election um, nomination process for Brett Kavanaugh mm-hmm. to the Supreme Court. What do you know about it so far? Don't go into it because I got all the facts. What do you know? Just like I know that Brett Kavanaugh was up for Supreme Court position right. and that a woman by the name of, what is her name? Christine, Christine Dr. Blasey Christine. Ford. Yeah said, oh, this cannot happen. Like, this man raped me. I've been traumatized for decades because of it. I've been seeing a therapist for a very long time. It's on and off. This man can't sit in the highest position in our judicial system. He's this horrible person who has showed no remorse or sympathy for me. He's single-handedly ruined my life. And so now it's all over the news and his trial has happened and she's testified and apparently he went up on the stand and he was like freaking out. He was crying and yelling. He was belligerent. And, uh, and she went up as like the strong white woman she is. She, not a strong. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Strong white woman is a thing now. Don't walk it back. Yeah. She, um, she held her composure. She defended herself. Right. She talked about exactly what happened and why it was important. And she doesn't want to be like a martyr or the spokesperson for sexual violence. She just wants to tell her story and to make sure that this man is held accountable for what he did to her. And, you know what I'm saying, what lots of other men have done to women and gotten away with it and are in these positions of power, it would be biased. He shouldn't have a job where he would be facing charges that he himself has committed. It's not right. So as far as some of the more nuts and bolts of, of the, the history of this scandal. It's like such a soap opera mm-hmm. with all the politics and yes. how much of this is political maneuvering and tactics and, and this and that. She first reached out um, to Senator Feinstein, who is Senator for her state. And when she first heard that he was on a short list to potentially be nominated. Mm-hmm. So to clear that up, it's not like his name popped out, for the hearings and she was like, Nope, I'm gonna shut this down. As soon as she got the idea, she was like, knowing what this man did to me, allegedly technically at this point, but for her perspective, knowing what this man did to me, it wouldn't be right for him to get on the Supreme court. Mm. So before his name is put out, really, I'm just going to throw this out there and maybe it'll be another person nominated. Right. Mm -hmm. What happened for whatever reason, is it political maneuvering? Is it this and that? Is it trickery? I don't know. Whatever. It didn't. It, it became public later on to the point when he was actually became the nominee, and there. So this is so scandalous, controversial. Republicans say it's it's made up, or they say the timing is purely political. There's a whole range of, you know, of of perspectives on their side. And after several days, ten days, I think it was, of this political back and forth of all this, he said, she said, yes, no, A, B, C. What is it going to be? They say, we'll have a hearing where we talk to both of them and we'll get the facts straight. Right. And so that's the big deal coming up to this week, which it happened on Thursday. Mm-hmm. Um, whew, it seems like the entire world was watching. Yeah, every single news outlet was covering it for 24 hours straight. Actually more because people are still talking about it incessantly. So. Yeah, well, and, and it's still going on. So um, before, again, we get into the co- the, the conversation around it, mm-hmm. What happened is they interviewed Dr. Ford, Blasey Ford. She gave her take on it. Then they interviewed uh, Judge Kavanaugh. He gave his 45-minute essay to start with. Whoa. It was a long testimony. They were like, you know, we allowed, like her, we allow you to give a little testimony before the hearing starts. Man, this guy went on. And I'll be honest with you, if it, if if this is 
a lot of how you fall on this is a coin flip. Is mm-hmm. it do you tend to believe him? Do you tend to believe her? Or do you tend to be Republican or do you tend to be Democrat? A lot of it just comes down to that how that coin lands. And I think both of them made strong cases for whichever side you're on. He came out, and I think if you already tended to believe him, he like did the damn thing. Right. I think he really con- convinced. Wow. Very well, he's a well. judge, so. Yeah, it was 45. At times, I was like, bro, you gotta, you're gonna ruin your own chances with this. Are you still talking? But then, like, there was lulls, and he picked it up. I think he made a strong case for himself. Um, not to say that I agree with him, and not to say I, I take his side on this, because I don't. I think it makes sense from all the information and everything we know about how these kind of things work out. Mm-hmm. I think she is more than credible on this accusation. Um, so I, I, I would side with Dr. Ford on this, but both sides made their points very strong. When she was done testifying, she d- went first. I was surprised. I was like, damn, dude, the Republicans did not come out <laughs> with a win wow. so far. But I was, so, so the weight, I think there was a big onus on him, on Kavanaugh to come out in that part of the hearing to really do a lot of heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. And I was surprised that I think it actually really did. And again, I don't think anything happened that day to change anyone's mind. I really don't. Mm. Maybe there was a couple people in there, you know, there's a very fringe who was maybe susceptible to sway either way. And so, all right, so what happened is Jeff Flake, senator from Arizona, he's outgoing. He's been very vocal against Trump because he's not going to run for re-election. So he's kind of like got that, you know, F the world mentality because what are you going to do to me? He ended up actually okaying the decision to, to go ahead and vote for Kavanaugh, yes or no. But on a condition that there's a thorough FBI investigation, uh, no details are released about what that investigation is going to be, mm-hmm. how thorough is thorough or anything like that. But that's a glimmer of hope that the fact that he said, OK, look, we can put it to a vote because it, it was a judiciary committee, which means there's 21 senators. He was one of them. They have to vote to say yes, take it to the Senate to vote for him or no. And so he said, I'll vote yes to take it to the Senate. But there's got to be this investigation. So I think that's a a glimmer of hope that Kavanaugh won't get um, nominated because for now he's a no until he's a yes. Not a yes until he's a no. no. Because if if that was the case, he would have been a yes. We would have went to vote today right? Or or, because it was set for Friday. And then last minute there was all types of political maneuverings and dealings and backdoor stuff. And this is what happened. Mm. So if you're still with us, that was a mouthful. I don't really know what to say because we have to take these little wins and celebrate them as wins because in so many instances, men just blatantly get off. So I think it's good that he's going to even be investigated and that they're giving her a chance to speak on such a national platform. Um, It's disgusting to me the whirlwind that goes into something like sexual assault and rape. And I, you know what? I haven't fully panned out what my thoughts on this are, so bear with me. But I think that it's good that people feel safe enough to speak out. But when it becomes a national story like this, and when it becomes blown out of proportion, we forget the fact that at the bottom of all of this, if he did in fact sexually assault her, because technically it's still pending, um, there's a woman who's been hurt. There's a woman who's been traumatized, and there's a woman who has to tell a story that's very, very deeply personal and very, very deeply painful to the entire world and have them pick it apart. And I think that we should take the time to, like, really think about how she's feeling. Uh, Other than, like, oh, she held it together. And, you know, and even I made a joke about it earlier, but, like, oh, she's so put together and she's so well spoken and she really delivered her point but like this woman has been traumatized this woman has been sexually yeah. assaulted it was hard to watch um there was a lot of tension there i mean i felt it for sure i don't know how people who are skeptical of her felt mm-hmm. but for a lot of people i mean it was it was definitely tense and hard to watch for that reason it was such an intimate thing it was very emotional to her um and 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 if you believe her then that's not a comfortable thing to right. witness right. you know There's actually a lot of women who have recently come out and talked about their own instances of sexual assault. As a matter of fact, um, the National Center, excuse me, of Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network reported that calls to their hotline for sexual abuse have been going up 
ever since this case has become publicized. So what they mentioned was that whenever you see sexual assault cases being broadcasted on the national news level, they see an increase in calls. But on the day that Dr. Ford did her, um, that she testified, they saw an increase by 201% of women just calling to say, like, this happened to me. And their perspective is that some of those women have been emboldened to speak out and to finally share their stories, but a lot of those women were simply just triggered by the fact that this is being talked about. And it's like, I don't necessarily want to talk about it, but I can't even hold it in anymore because I'm so overwhelmed by everybody talking about sexual assault and I need to talk to somebody about this or I'm, like, going to explode. So I think it's interesting that those are the two perspectives of people who are speaking out um, and that lots of other sexual assault hotlines have reported the same thing, that they see the increase, but with this particular case, like, people reporting and making the calls is going through the roof and so many people um, have just been encouraged to share their story and on C-SPAN this past week also the same day that the testifying took place they had women actually call in while Dr. Ford was testifying to share their stories on air Mm C-SPAN CNBC well the story that I read said that it was C-SPAN no I'm misremembering yeah no it was just Um, but it said that yeah, women called in and they were just like, well, yeah, this happened to me and I support her. I stand behind her and I'm proud of her for even speaking out. And I want to share my story, not just on a hotline, but like feel free to broadcast this live and let the entire world listen. And it was so emotional to watch. And so many people were moved just by hearing these women back to back calling and saying, I feel so moved. I want the whole world to know what happened to me. Some women shared their names. Some didn't. But like they were like, it's powerful. For someone to say, this is who I am, and this is what I went through, and this is why it matters. Which then prompted women like all around the world to share their stories using the hashtag, why I didn't report. Because people are like, why'd you wait so long? Yeah. Why'd you wait so long? You just want to stop this man from being great. You just want to stop him from being successful. And they're like, there's actually so many reasons why women don't report. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, I mean, I've read a number of really uncomfortable testimonies on my own timelines mm-hmm. since then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's shocking and kind of scary to see how prevalent it is when it really starts to become people you know, right? Like, I, I, I know, I've known the statistics mm-hmm. about things, and um, to some extent, you know, uh, that, you know, what, two-thirds never go reported at all. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times it takes many years. and But over the last year, you know, since the Me Too movement, to see all these stories really come out, in very explicit, detailed, personal ways mm-hmm. from people I know very personally has, has just made it even tougher, more, yeah, tough, uh, more real. And from men, because we're also talking about this in the midst of um, Cosby being um, actually sentenced and put in jail. Finally. And for men... A lot of us are reluctant to believe women in these situations because the the story that we imagine for ourselves that this is a lie is scary enough for us to think what happens when it's us. Mm. And that overrides most other instincts. And I think that's really the reason why a lot of men oppose it or resist it because the implications of A... What if I get falsely accused one day? Wow. So we got to just make sure we shut everything off because of the possibility of false accusations. But also I think it's it's a guilty conscience, whether you're guilty or not. I'm a man. This is a man. He's getting accused. Suddenly now you feel threatened. Yeah. Or maybe to a much more direct connection, maybe you've done some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And now you're like, hold chill. I'm not a rapist. Right. I'm not, I never did anything wrong, but that's what I did. And so on one level or another, you're, a lot of men feel implicated, whether they're because of possible future accusations, because just guilt by association of being a man as well, or that you actually are seeing yourself in these situations. Mm -hmm. And we got to do better to overcome that. And be honest with ourselves, if we've done that stuff to say, shit, I might have to rethink my life, 
right? I might have to rethink my relationships and how I behave. Or you might have to just understand and bite the bullet, say, okay, um, we got to take any accusation seriously. And if that means I get accused one day and it's false, I'm just going to have to handle that when it's my time. Mm. But it's not like men are left and right just getting accused and lives ruined, but they're high profile that they make us think it could be us. Right. And we've got to be stronger and do better to just say, okay, but we do have credible, legitimate crimes being committed here. And we got to face those. Yeah, you know what? See, that's really good that you were able to be that honest and that genuine in the way that you just explained that because I not, I feel like I kind of get it now because I've asked this question to men so many times, like, why do you react to these stories the way that you do? And I don't know that I've ever gotten an answer that's been that clear and that just genuine. So I just want to say that I appreciate that. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting that you said, like, we wonder, like, as you all as men, well, what if I've done that? Am I a rapist? I'm not a rapist. I now have to defend this person who very well may have done something worse or similar, but really in my mind I'm I'm defending myself and my actions in case this woman comes out and says that I did it. I need the world to know that, like, nah, yeah. it's not okay to say that about people. Because sexual assault exists on such a broad spectrum with, like, violent rape being an extreme case, but then also just kind of, coercing a woman or manipulating a woman into doing something she doesn't want being on yes the lighter end of the spectrum but still being considered sexual assault and it's something that happens so regularly but yeah i mean really need to stop. it's it's pressure and to what point is pressure a crime or just it, like is it, is it acceptable because yeah. cause, it's mean, normalized behavior yeah you know and that's that's a trick because sure there is a little bit of of I don't know, convincing sometime or whatever, mm -hmm. sweet talk, you know, yeah, get the person there. But it's a very blurry line, of course, it's where so you really blurry. cross into exists. being a creep or a jerk or as we saw with a debate with um, Aziz Ansari, right? There was mm -hmm. a lot of people saying, mm -hmm. come on, okay, yeah, I get it. He was uncomfortable in his territory and this and that. But, you know, where's the line between just, you know, we're both here, you know, being horny is a powerful feeling and stuff and... It, that's that's a hard line, but yeah, we have to be more honest and, and uh, you know, so what if we if we misunderstand the line too strictly? It I mean, then that's kind of you know, stinks right? for guys. Sorry, we just gotta tighten up. But if we don't interpret it strictly enough, now we got a lot of people legitimately, you know, violated. Yes. And I, I saw some, a good com analogy that grown men are coming out as elderly, as middle-aged, as, as young adults, saying that they were raped and assaulted by priests 30 years ago. Yeah. And we don't question why they waited so long, right? Ooh, we get right. it. You're right. And this is going back to what I was saying about like the Tambon oh. thing in the prison mm -hmm. and the way we put a lot of expectation on women and we trust men a lot more. See, I have never thought about that, but no one has questioned why they waited, at least right. to my it's, knowledge. Yeah, it's not, I haven't seen it. Right, so it's not like, oh, oh, but you could have said that 20 years ago. Yeah, but mm. this is messed up. This story runs and, deep. And I think for a lot of people out there, that might be the key. Is like, look, how did you feel about those cases when you heard them? If if that's how you felt, translate that position over here to Dr. Ford or to anyone else, and now you know how to feel. Right. Because um, in a lot of ways in our society, we take men's account for default. I mean, just like in movies. You have a, a movie about a man. Men and women around the country are expected to watch it. You have a movie about a woman, about a woman, and women will definitely go see it. Maybe some guys will see it, but mm -hmm. it's like a woman's movie. Mm -hmm. Why is male storytelling the default, right? That women are expected to consume as well, mm -hmm. and it applies here. We we trust the male victims of of church abuse, but we don't trust the female victims of, of male abuse. Uh, and so Cosby finally paid his price he is this paying week. he has not paid it yet he's got a lot more he True. owes a lot yeah. more um so yeah bill cosby was finally convicted and arrested for the sexual not all of them but for a lot of the sexual assault accusations that were made against him and he was actually sentenced to three to ten years in prison um so what's going on right now is he's in jail in pennsylvania and he's spending a lot of time in isolation because he's such a high profile case number one and number two people who rape once they go to jail they are not 
treated very nicely. So the prison system is trying to figure out what to do with him. And it's very interesting because I don't consider myself a person who sympathizes with Bill Cosby at all. Like, I think that no matter how old you are, you need to pay for what you've done to other people. But the way that this particular story was written kind of made me feel like, man, he's 83 years old and this is what he's going through. So I just want to read some of it. It says, he spent his first day in the prison as he will spend many days, mostly alone. He slept alone Tuesday night on a cot, cot bolted to the floor of a cell he shares with no one. When the door was unlocked Wednesday morning, he sl- stepped into a TV room that was empty except for his guards. Several cells identical to his own lined the walls in this section of State Correctional Institute in Phoenix, and every one of them was vacant. He ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner by himself. He walked the yard with no company four times that day. Before lights out, a guard walked the unit to count the prisoners, and the count was always one. So when I read that, I was like, dang. Damn. <laughs> yeah, like he's spending a lot of time alone, and he's going to be that way for probably the next week or two. So I was like, mm, I couldn't imagine being old as heck and committing all these crimes in my prime. Like everybody's on Coke and Molly, and we just having sex like willy-nilly. Of course, his was non-consensual. <laughs> Um, and then finally being like this really old grouchy man and getting locked up and spent, spending all this time in like some cold, empty jail. Like mm. it kind of made me feel sad for him as an old person. But then I was like, but, but not no. as Bill Cosby. Right. The man. I'm like, but yeah. I mean, you sexually assaulted like, yeah, I mean, if so many, he people. wouldn't have the same level of sympathy if he was 36. I we, would not be like, get this man the hell out of here. Because he's old. Yeah. Um, but I don't feel like, oh, people waited too long. Or, oh, why is this happening to Bill Cosby? Which is something yeah. that I've been seeing all over, like, yeah. social media. Bill Cosby should be free. Everybody just doing this to him because he's black. Or Bill Cosby's old. Cut him a break. That's so old. No. You don't get to just skate by because of your race or because of your age or because of your income when you've raped and assaulted people. You just don't. When you drugged people involuntarily, not once or twice, but like, oh my God, there were 60 accusations. All 60 of those people is not making it up. Bill Cosby deserves right. to be riding in jail. And I need for, this is what I was saying earlier. Men, stop defending foolishness. Stop thinking like, oh, it could be me or just like what Steve said, even though to a certain extent I get it. There's no excuse for you to say that this man does not deserve to be held accountable for what he did. He absolutely does. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and he, he admitted it in 2005 yeah. in, in a courtroom. Um, and also a lot of the conversation around Bill Cosby has been, well, how come other high profile white men haven't been mm-hmm. held accountable? And Harvey Weinstein's trial is set for a couple of days after the election, November 8th or 9th or something like that. So he's facing it right now. Some people will say, yeah, he'll never go to jail. Okay, you're skeptical of uh, that it'll work, but fine. But he's he's set to have that hearing coming up. Uh, and that was relatively quickly after he was outed, like, what, a year and a half ago or two yeah. years ago or something mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. right? So that's happening pretty quickly. Cosby has been publicly accused since, like, 2000. Yeah. So... People have been trying to nab him for a long time. And it's happening because the uh, the evidence was overwhelming. The time that's, that's spanned for all this to come out, for it to finally play out, has been so long. And it could be, it was, you know, unable to be refuted, right? And so maybe some of these people over that amount of time will we'll also get held accountable. Right. And we got to figure out a way to shorten that amount of time. Um, Yeah, 18 years is way too long. And it's actually, it's strange because the people who are saying, like, don't arrest him because Weinstein isn't arrested and all this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, if your argument was he shouldn't be in jail because he's not guilty, I would be like, okay, you believe he's not guilty, but at least you stand on something. Or if your argument was they should all be in jail also, also something that I could see your perspective on. But when you say he shouldn't be in jail because they're not, then you're thinking that, like, what? He actually, they all should be in jail. Not none should be in jail. Right, as many as we can get. Right, what's going on? Yeah. So that that's my take on the whole entire thing. It's it's really uh, frustrating. I'm overwhelmed with how much assault is in the news, so I get it. It's triggering to me. It's triggering to a lot of women because, honestly, we go through so much. We just go through so much, and I don't think people recognize how tough it is. 
Yeah. Um, well, that's a perfect segue uh, because I've talked a lot in this segment, but I want to ask you personally, like when these kind of things are happening in the news, when you're having these conversations with people, how does this affect you personally as, as a woman? Like, are you looking at these people differently? Are you looking at your walk through your neighborhood and through your life and at work? And are you looking at your life differently? I mean, just break into that. Cause I've, I've already said plenty mm-hmm. and I'm just a bystander in a lot of this. I don't think I'm looking at my life differently and this is very personal. But I don't think that I'm necessarily looking at my life differently as much as I start to look at my life through a microscope. And I start to examine some of the ways that I've been taken advantage of and some of the ways that my voice has been overpowered by the voice of either a man trying to talk over me or a man trying to silence me on telling my story and telling my perspective of something that happened. And it's sad because I can confidently say the same thing about most of the women who I know. We can all sit around and just talk. And I think that men can be shocked to find out how many women who you're close to or how many women you're in proximity to in your personal life can share these types of stories. And you might be like, what? Because in the same way that you can say, it could be me. That's why I feel like I have to defend it. But then when you realize, oh, my gosh, it could be my sister. Or it was my sister. It is my sister. And then you're like, you get a news flash and you're like, I shouldn't be defending this. I feel terrible. Now I'm defending because it's on a light scale of sexual assault. And now here I am, my mother, my sister, my auntie are telling me it happened to them. And I want to go and kick somebody's ass. But yesterday I didn't see a problem with it because I was only thinking about myself. Because I know there are times where I've been like, well, you know, this happened to me. Or someone said this to me or someone did this to me. And the men in my life, you can just see them having like that moment of, what? You? And it's like, yeah, actually, just about every woman I know, honestly, because like I was just saying to you a minute ago, y'all have to tell your people, like, when they're wrong, even if it could be you. When you see trash happening, you can't be like, oh, but that's my boy. Like, oh, man, yeah, I get it, man. It's crazy. You got to be like, yo, that is wrong there can be no pussy fitting around it and I know it's weird because women do that and we we aren't necessarily let me not make a double standard women do do things to men as well whether it's manipulation or what have you but when I do stuff that's wrong my friends are on my ass about it like what are you doing you don't treat people that way you don't talk to people like that you're wrong you can't be mad at him because blah 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 and I just take it because I'm like they're right. That's why I have friends in my life, because they support me. But when I'm wrong, like, they are not afraid to cut into me. And so I have the same expectation for a lot of people in my life. So I personally just – that's my personal perspective when I hear these types of stories. Those are the places that my mind goes. All right. Guys, we got to do better. We got to think of ourselves more critically. We got to watch each other more critically. And uh, we got to start believing the women in our lives Protecting more. them. And unfortunately, we got to start believing the women in the media more because that's where we're hearing these stories. And we're not hearing it from the people in our lives as much because we it's hard for you guys to come out with it. Mm-hmm. So I think when we do come across these stories, whether it's Dr. Blasey Ford or um, anybody else, you know, on these high profile levels, we got to start taking that more seriously. And understanding that it's more personal than we realize. Deep stuff. Yeah. That was a great show. I feel good about it. Listen, everybody, thanks for listening. My name is Steve Discourse. This is Jake Halley. That's the deal.